these desires that you're feeling aren't, don't take credit for them and don't take the blame for them. They're placed there by your impersonal self that takes care of all of your thoughts. Because you can't think, you can't get a hold of a thought. You can go inside the brain and you can find the command center in the, bla- in the brain where thoughts originate. We can find the command center in there. But no one, no scientist has ever been able to find the commander in the command center. That's in, you think it's in your brain, but lots of evidence now. It's not, it's not in your brain. They've now got scientific evidence that thinking takes place outside of the brain. The brain is here. Thinking's taking place someplace else. That it's in morphogenetic fields. That read Rupert Sheldrake. It's all around us. That we're just, it's a constantly tune in. Tuning in, tuning in. We can't figure this out with our intellect any more than we can figure out what that Hubble telescope is starting to realize. And can you imagine? That thing is 360 miles above the Earth, and they took those pictures of that Andromeda. They're going to get one that's going to circulate a million miles around the Earth. They're going to put it into that kind of an orbit out there with a camera on it to go into... So, trying to you know, trying to figure out what you want to do is try to try to understand your soul. Your soul is um, your soul is that inter- interior part of you, okay, interior, but it's all around you. It's the uh, yeah. I have I have eight children and. Before I had any children, I had eight theories about how to raise children. And today, I have eight children, and I have no theories about how to raise children. They all have their own uniqueness, and they all come, they come in with personalities and things. So, <clears throat> one of the things I know about raising children is about their souls. One of the things I know for certain is that no one likes being told what to do. No one likes being told what to do. Because it's their soul speaking. You know that you've all heard this from your kids and you think it's being bratty at the moment. But you know, it's, uh, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. You've all heard this stuff. Now, those aren't the words of a bratty child just trying to exercise, the, you know. That's the child's soul saying, I have a mission, I have a purpose, I have a dharma, I've got something that I'm here for. Don't put a leash on me. Don't put me in a box. They have a theme song. The theme song of the, of the soul of a child. It was sung by Roy Rogers. Oh, give me land, lots of land, and the starry skies above. Let me ride through the wide open spaces that I love. I can't hear you. Don't fence me in. Don't Don't put a leash on me. You know what? Even a friggin' cat (laughs) understands this. Even a cat. That's you. That was you when your parents tried to put a leash on you. When they wanted to tell you what to do and how to behave and what to do. Your soul is infinite. Now, this is what I wrote about the soul. The ideal of the soul, the thing that it asks for, is neither knowledge or light or happiness. The ideal of the soul, your soul, This interiority, this impersonal self that is what you always have with you, what do you think it is? 
space, expansion. I wrote this all out. The ideal of the soul is space, immensity. The one thing it needs is to be free to expand and reach out and to embrace the infinite. Now think about these two words, finite and infinite. Think about them. What does the word finite mean? Finite, finished, stops someplace, right? That's what it is, it's finite. This is finite. It stops someplace. It has boundaries. It has a beginning. It has an end, okay? Except it's not, I'm just talking about the clay now. Everything that you can see out here is finite. It has a beginning. And your body itself, finite, has a beginning, has an end. Although I don't think it has to. And ultimately, I think we will begin to realize this. Ultimately, it's our destiny to, to know that. The opposite of finite is infinite, right? And what does infinite mean? It means it doesn't stop any place. That's what infinity is. Right there from William Blake. If you could cleanse the doors of perception and see things as they are, it's all infinite, like the universe. It's infinite, which means it doesn't stop any place. That's the soul saying, don't put a leash on me. Don't fence me in. Don't put me in a box. Don't tell me how to do things. We have a little saying in our family with the kids when they come to Maui and they start telling me how I should be running my house. You know, Dad, you should put things here. You should put things there. This shouldn't be over there. This is too messy over there. This is hard. And you know, I've got eight kids, six girls. So they're <clears throat> in there a lot, you know, trying to reorganize and fix things. And I always say, all I have to do is say, um, there's a very famous German philosopher, and they know exactly what I'm saying. That's all we have to say anymore, because I explained to them what Nietzsche said, Friedrich Nietzsche, great <coughs> thinking German philosopher. He said, this is my way. <laughs> what is your way? The way doesn't exist. And then I put things back where they are, and I say, when I come into your home, I will honor the way you do yours, and, you know. But, Dad, this is a, I'll say, there's a very faint, okay, I got it. That's a, hardly even have to say anything anymore. All right. It's, it's, the soul, all it wants to do is expand. I mean, from the time that this baby starts crawling, then they want to, then they've got to walk. And then, you know, what is a two-year-old, like, what is it when they say, well, you have to child-proof your house? What does that mean? It means everything around has to be moved that could possibly cause them because they have to, to explore everything. They have to touch everything. They have to pick everything up. They have to taste it, put it in their mouth. They, like, this is what they do all day long. And you walk, follow a two-year-old around, it's like exhausting. This is the book of Matthew. This is Jesus speaking. And it's one that I looked at a lot and studied a lot and didn't quite understand it the first 50 or 60 times perhaps that I heard it or read it. But the spiritual literature is replete with, with repetitions of this quote from Jesus. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be one or be single the whole body shall be filled with light what does that mean think about it what did Jesus mean by that's exact quote Matthew 6 22 the light of the body is the eye this is what we see with this is what we experience with if therefore thine eye be single We're speaking here about oneness. 
We're speaking here about unity consciousness, about oneness. The I that only sees oneness. When you leave this body, you will only see oneness. You have to try to imagine that everything that we experience in our life, we see in dualities, in dichotomies. So the opposite of up is down. And if there's no opposite of up, then we don't need the word up. The opposite of east is west. The opposite of male is female. The opposite of good is bad. This is the duality that we live in. It's conflict. This conflicts with that. In the Course in Miracles, it says the memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. A mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. Eternal gentleness. It's what we came from. It's our original nature, according to Lao Tzu. Eternal gentleness. There is no opposite in the other realm. Imagine a world in which the eye sees only one. Only love. No opposite of love. The opposite of love in this physical world that we're in is hate or fear or stress or all of this stuff. And we're constantly seeing everything in its dualities. But when you can see and experience with your eye single or oneness, then your whole body shall be filled with light. Does that make sense now? Isn't that beautiful? Such a, such, a, such a simple, wonderful concept. The light of the body is the eye. This is how you perceive perception. If thine eye be therefore single and sees only love, and it's, 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 it's a hard concept to get because you can only understand oneness when you're with your source. I don't know if you've seen the thing that I did with Abraham, the uh, co-creating at its best. I think it, I have a couple of them up here. Um, this is what Abraham speaks about. I mean, we had a three-hour conversation where she was tough on me. <laughs> when I was trying to justify my anger at uh, GMOs and things, uh, she just, I kept reminding her that I'm a famous person, you know, you got to talk nice to me. She said, you want me to change the law of attraction for you? Oh, never mind. <laughs> so how can you... We need a visual to grasp this, see. So I always say, imagine if you lived on the sun, which is the source of all light. All of our light that we see, all of our natural light that we get on the planet comes from the sun, right? No question about that. And that thing is up there, 93.1 million miles from Earth. And it is just burning itself up. It's just burning. It's just a whole bunch of gases and things that are just burning and burning and burning. And in case you're worried about whether it's going to burn itself out, because how could something be up there burning like that and just never burn itself out? They estimate it's going to be about 40 billion more years before it even begins to diminish a tiny bit such as and that's just one tiny tiny little sun but imagine you lived on the sun if you lived on the sun you had a house on the sun would there be any darkness would there be a word called darkness think about it it's not possible is it it's the source of light. When you're with the source of light, there is no darkness. You only see 
light. There's no opposite because you're with the source. The source of us, our impersonal self, is love. Love. We come from love. We return to love. When you're with the source, there's no opposite. You're seeing one. When you're able to do that, when you don't applaud, like the, the thing I learned from the Tao, I mean, reading the Tao is one thing, reading the Tao Te Ching, you can read it in an hour. To study it the way I did and to live it, I lived each verse for four and a half days and then sat down and, and just channeled those essays that are in I Can Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. Um, <clears throat> the great lesson of the Tao is that uh, there's no such thing as enemy. I mean, Lao Tzu left the, the, the warring states because he just could no longer tolerate what, and he, he, uh, he dictated the Tao Te Ching, legend tells us, um, from the, on the gates of the city before they would let him, because people had come from all over the world to see Lao Tzu. Even Confucius, who was, you know, his, uh, was 40 years younger than Lao Tzu, but who was always coming to him and asking him for advice and so on. Um, but Lao Tzu dictated the, the Tao in just, you know, a few hours, I think. I don't, you know, I, don't, I wasn't there. <laughs> but that's what legend tells us. And it's over and over and over again, this idea that, that, that war and enemies and are just an absence of an awareness of the light that is within us. And that loving is all you can see when, when your eye be single, when your eye perceives single, then um, your whole world becomes filled with light. And I've been working on this personally in my life. And when I I didn't do it, it just last two weeks ago, not even two weeks ago, a week ago. I found myself behaving in a way that I didn't like. I even saw a picture of myself walking down to say something to someone who was doing something annoying in front of where I live. And and when it was over, when I, when I, and I did it as nicely and as lovingly and as positive as I possibly could, asking this person to... To turn the volume down or something. I wasn't. It's not a big deal what it was. It was that I went there with, I'm right and you're wrong in my heart. Still, still a week ago. And when it was over and I walked away from it, I thought, oh, God, you fucked up again. How can you do that? <laughs> I just, it's like, there I am. <laughs> And I get, I have, a, I still have the picture in my head. I see this old, angry white man walking down, talking to the people who live there in Hawaii, who are Hawaiian, who have every right to this island. It's, you know, I'm just a visitor there. I know all of that, and I see, I see this old man walking down there and talking to turn it up because it's a public beach, and we can all this and doing all of that stupid stuff, and then them getting upset, and I get upset, and I think, oh my. God, you still, you know, but I, <clears throat> I want to just have love in my heart, and I get, I get tested so much. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that tests me is noise. You know, I like silence. I, I meditate a couple times a day. I, I mean, I, I love silence. I don't like loud and all of that, and. I've got, to, I've got to really learn how to just love the people who are doing it. Whatever it is, to like act like I'm living on the sun. And then when I imagine myself, I just look and say, if they want to play their music that way, well, let them, you know, what is your problem with this, you know? Or just close your doors or, you know, whatever. Um, seeing one, only love. In the last week, I've, I haven't had one thought like that. So, I used to have one every 
five or six minutes. You know? So I'm just better than I used to be, but it's this God, like, I want to be like the orange. I only want to give away what's inside. And I have to decide what's going to be inside. There's a lady here in the, in the house who's from Portland, who I met, oh my goodness, I don't know, a couple of years ago, two or three years ago. Um, she was, um, well, she's here. Can you walk? Mm. Her name, name is Dana. I know. She told me. Lisa Gang. Nobody's named Lisa Gang. Anyway, when I met her, she was an angry, bitter, hostile, hateful, filled with rage person. She was. She'll admit it. She's in a wheelchair. She was in the United States Navy. She was raped when she was, how old were you, Dana? 18, 19. Um, thrown over a 75-foot cliff and left to die while she was in the United States military. And her body was broken in every way possible. She was in a wheelchair. She hadn't walked. She had no control over her bowels. She, had, she was like... And I, I met her on a, I met her down in, was it Australia? Was it, uh, yeah. Um, and she's wearing my purple hat. Because I, when I saw her the first time, she's been a friend of Skies and Serena's and so on. She's come on tours with me. She's been on cruises with me. She shows up a lot. She's writing a book that we're publishing at Hay House uh, called uh, Falling Up falling up um, <clears throat> and I gave her I was wearing a, I was wearing a hat like this and it was purple and I put it on her and I said you can have that and you can give it back to me when you walk and then I saw her I think it was in Denver the first time I saw her actually walk got out of that chair and walked um, but she won't give me the hat back <laughs> I don't understand that and, um, and she's here, she's from Portland. And when you see her now, if, if, and the difference between, and it's like she's starting to see, she's starting to see the way Jesus is asking us to see. Let thine eye be single. That is, see only oneness. And her body is filled with light. Um, come on up, can you come up? Uh, sure. I want her to tell a little bit about her story. Not a lot. This is an amazing, amazing story, what she has done and what she is doing and how she has put love inside of her heart where so much hate and anger had lived for so long. We look at this lady. Look at her. It's, she's an unbelievable. Hi. So proud of you. You look so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Thank you. Yeah. So just in just in a couple of minutes, uh, there's been such a transformation take place in your life, Dana. What? Uh, share if you can, uh, just a little bit of what happened and where you are now, and why. Um, well, 23 years ago, I was raped and thrown off a cliff, as Wayne said, left to die. I started out um, with a doctor saying that. I'd be lucky to survive the night. Um, since then, I had plotted and wished and hoped for this young man to die, and I'd make him a quadriplegic. And then I, too, went to see John of God on Wayne's suggestion. And I asked for the ability to see with my eyes closed. And what I found was forgiveness in my heart. And I found love instead of anger for this young man. And I found sadness because he had died and a mother was left without her son. And I called her and, and I told her what had happened because she didn't even know. And then she cried with me and asked me what she could do for me. And I said, forgive yourself because I know parents blame themselves for the wrongdoings of their children. And every door since I've found 
love in my own heart for myself and others has just slammed wide open. Wayne's writing the foreword to my book, and his daughter Serena was a huge catalyst in getting me this book deal. I didn't even have a dream really to write a book. It found me. And here I am and telling you my story and my wish is that everybody finds forgiveness for themselves, others around them, and the freedom and love that forgiveness gives you. Oh, that's so beautiful, Dana. I love you so much. Give me a kiss, dude. Here, Dana. There. Okay. And uh, if I, the story that and I've seen her, I've seen her walk up the Acropolis with me in Greece, uh, on her in her wheelchair. Um, she's she just turned her life around from a angry hurt. When the first time I talked to her, she just was basically telling me that none of this works with me. You don't know what I've been through, and. Um, feeling sorry for herself and so on and uh, and she's turned all of that around in such a, such a marvelous way it's uh, I get very emotional seeing you here uh, sweetheart it reminds me of what, of what Thoreau said about success my favorite definition of success he said if you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams and endeavor to live the life which you have imagined, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. Uh, it's a very powerful awareness. So the final poster says this. And this you really need to memorize and know. <clears throat> that the laws of the material world do not apply in the presence of the God realized. I was on the Tonight Show in uh, Sydney, Australia, the equivalent of the Tonight Show there, and they asked me, oh, this is oh, 20 years ago or more, um, a woman asked me the question, what is your mission? What are, why are you here? just out of the blue, and I said, I would like to experience God realization. And I wasn't even quite sure what that meant, but I, I do now. And it's having <clears throat> that light inside, seeing only love, even in the faces of people who do horrific and hor horrendous things that are too terrible to even describe. Being able to uh, to live from that perspective, and in the um, in the life and masters of the uh, life and teachings of the masters of the Far East, um, they <clears throat> they speak about. what it means to transcend these laws. Dana said that she didn't, um, she didn't ever think a book deal would come to her it, it, or that she'd ever be able to write a book, but that it just came to her. Anita's uh, story is one in which it just, it came to her. The experience of the cancer came and the experience of the healing came and the experience of now being a worldwide phenomenon and best-selling author and so on all just came to you without without seeking it without searching for it one of the things I just wanted to share with you is from Lao Tzu um, it says this is verse 59 of the Hua Hu Ching he said, if you wish to become a divine immortal angel, then restore the angelic qualities of your being through virtue 
than service. This is the only way to gain the attention of the immortals who teach the methods of energy enhancement and integration that are necessary to reach the divine realm. These angelic teachers cannot be sought out. It is they who seek out the student. And when I get people saying, I want you to do this for me, I want you to do this for me, do this for me, I, <clears throat> I always know that you, you, you have to let it come to you. It's that what Thoreau said, if you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams, that is what's in your imagination, and endeavor to live the life which you have imagined, what's in your imagination, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. It, that's how this universe works. You have to align yourself with the energy of those you know, those angels. I have a whole chapter in that book of Memories of Heaven uh, about angel stories, you know, and Doreen Virtue is a dear friend of mine. She lives on Maui as well, and she writes, talks a lot about this angel, business of angels. But Lao Tzu puts it in a different way. He says, these angelic teachers cannot be sought out. It is they who seek out the teacher. When you succeed in connecting your energy with the divine realm, through higher awareness and the practice of undiscriminating virtue, the transmission of the ultimate subtle truths will follow. This is the path that all angels take to the divine realm. And then on verse 60, he says, the mystical techniques, the mystical techniques for achieving immortality are revealed only to those who have dissolved all ties to the gross worldly realm of duality, conflict, and dogma. As long as your shallow worldly ambitions exist, the door will not open. You just got to detach yourself from this worldly experience of conflict and duality. And until you're able to do that, and once you, once you do it, you'll start seeing these angels showing up for you in so many ways, whether you call them angels or guidance or someone directs me to Vasistha's yoga. I couldn't even say that. I can try to imagine Barbara Walters saying Vasistha's yoga. Vasistha's yoga. That would be impossible. Huh? <laughs> Poor Baba Wawa. <laughs> In writing, I can see clearly now, as, as I went through so many of the pathways and the turns and the, the things that, you know, the, the, first, f the first four books, I don't have these numbers exactly right, the first five books that I wrote, when I, went, when I wrote, I can see clearly, I, went, I lined up every book that I had written, all 44 of them. And, you know, it was going through what was my life like while I was reading these and what was going, because I was trying to look at what guided me from this and this, from erroneous sounds and pulling your own strings and the sky's the limit and they said, what do you want for your children? All of these books that I wrote at the beginning and I look in the index of all of these books and the word God, spirit or higher consciousness is mentioned once in five books. One, to, one reference in five books to God, spirituality, higher consciousness, higher awareness. Once. My next book is, you'll see it when you believe it, and I look at the uh, index, 39 references to God and spirit in the very next book. Well, I didn't sit down and say, oh, I better get some more spirit into this. I better get some God in here, and I liked it. I have no idea. It's just what showed up. Next book's called, There's a Spiritual Solution to Every Problem. It's in the title. Okay. It's some, there's... There's this guidance that allows you when you're listening and when you're willing to act on these burning desires that are in there, that are placed in there for you by your impersonal self, the same one that's growing all of our fingernails. And as you just get accustomed to allowing and letting it go, and that's what Abraham speaks about so brilliantly, so beautifully. I mean, I'm just, I'm blown away by, by Esther Hicks, you know, work that she does through using Abraham. Um, <clears throat> this is something that we can, we, we can each and every one of us 
have an experience of if we just have this this kind of this trusting thing so when I say that the laws of the material world do not apply in the presence of the God realized things begin to happen there that you we just can't explain the right people they just show up the right events begin to as you shift it's like if you're demanding it and looking for it and wanting it and, and asking for the miracle and please show me and show me the light and all of that the way that you it seems to me that the way that you get angelic guidance is by being like the angels because I don't think they recognize themselves when you're living in conflict. Remember what I said earlier about from A Course in Miracles. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. A mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. It doesn't remember who you really are, which is just gentle, just gentleness and kindness and love as long as you're in that state of conflict when you start removing that things the right people the right events the money it begins to flow in in in, in ways that you never even dreamed of when I left the big fear that I always had because I grew up with a poverty consciousness you know depression mentality my mother in the depression in the in the 20s and, and especially in the 30s and i was born in, in 1940 and it was like there was never enough and 10 years in an orphanage it's food i mean hunger i remember it well there's nothing that i won't eat even today this is one the, <coughs> although i stopped a lot of that stuff but i don't have any thing inside of me that says don't eat this because it doesn't taste very good when i hear my kids say eh, i wouldn't eat that oh i don't like that i think you know when, when we were growing up it's like we were watching everybody's plate <laughs> you know in case anybody would leave anything on there that was ours we would grab that you know it's a, you, you you develop sort of a, a different kind of awareness and the and leaving a, a tenured position was really about finances it was about thinking what if I, I'm not going to be able to make it? I'm not going to support my family. I'm not going to be able to pay my bills. And that those are really big time things for someone who was raised the way I was raised, you know. Um, and in the first year, the first year that I left with a totally unknown book, I made more money in the first year than I had made the previous 36 years of my life in one year. Because it will flow to you. It will come to you when you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams. And live the life which you have imagined. Your imagination is the greatest gift you've ever been given. And these laws that we think of as the laws of the physical world. You know, that there's such a thing as cause and effect. I can't tell you how many times in Vasistha's Yoga they say... A crow lands on a coconut tree, and at the second that it lands on a coconut tree, the coconut falls to the ground. And there is no cause and effect relationship between the two. In fact, it says in Vasistha's Yoga, there's no such thing as cause and effect any place, that every single event is its own unique event. And our universe is constantly being recreated, recreated every instant of it. And it's, every time you use that, you see a crow, it lands, the fall, you say, well, the crow landing on it caused it. No, according to Vasistha Yoga. It left when it was supposed to. Because it's all taken care of by the impersonal self. It has, the crows don't have that ability to do that. That's all within us. So here's what it says, and then we're going to do a, a short meditation. On page 109 of volume 2, The Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East. The moment men become free from the belief that they are mere human beings, subject to human laws of life and death, and the limitations which human beings have imposed, that moment they will see that they are free from all human limitations and may become sons of God if they will. The moment they realize they are divine, they are free from all limitations and possessed of the strength of divinity 
And man knows that this divinity is the place where being comes most directly in contact with God. Man is beginning to see and know that this divinity is not something to be injected into each from without. He is beginning to know that it is the very life of each and every man. And then they speak about healing in a beautiful way. He said, these words are just as true for us as they are true of Jesus. Your sins, your sicknesses, your discords are no more a part of God or your true self than fungi are a part of the plants to which they attach themselves. They are the false excrescences which have gathered upon your bodies as the result of wrong thinking. The thought of the disease and the disease are merely the cause Erase, forgive the cause, and the effect disappears. Erase the false belief, and sickness vanishes. This was the only method of cure that Jesus ever resorted to. He erased the false image in the consciousness of the one to whom he ministered. He first raised the vibrations of his body by connecting his own thoughts with those of divine mind and holding his own thoughts steadfastly in accord with those of the perfection of the divine mind for man. Then the vibrations of his body became equal to the vibrations of divine mind, and healing took place. You have the capacity to do that, to heal things, to communicate telepathically, to... Um, defy gravity to be able to attract anything that you put your attention on the laws of the material world they just don't apply these are all things that are written out in science and so on but there's something much more profound and it's the state of God realization and when you get there disease seems like an impossibility for you it just doesn't seem like that's that could possibly be your reality any longer. The laws of the material world. Thank you. They're not laws that you have to live by. So to put all of this into perspective, we need to do about a 10 minute meditation. We're gonna do just a short meditation. And um, this is something that I try and do every morning whenever I have time. So if everyone can just sit comfortably with your feet on the floor. Just completely relax. Relax your hands on your lap. And I want you to bring your awareness to the top of your head and feel the muscles around your head and your forehead just completely relax. When we overthink, we tend to store a lot of the tension in our forehead, in the muscles. I want you to bring your awareness to your jaw and feel the muscles around your jaw completely relax and the muscles around your eyes and your eyebrows. I want you to actually envision the tension as energy just dissipating, just melting away. I want you to give that tension some kind of color and see it just melting away from your jaw, from your forehead. Now go down to your neck area and just wriggle your neck a little bit, shake your head 
as if you're loosening the tension. And now just see that tension as a color just dissolving and just melting away. And now do the same with your shoulders. Just give your shoulders a little shake. As though you're loosening the tension. And then just feel that tension just melting away. Now I want you to notice the lightness on your shoulders. It feels like a weight has been lifted off. Now I want you to become aware of your chest area and your breath and become aware of your breathing. I want you to breathe deeply in and out. And I want you to envision that with every in-breath, you are inhaling beautiful, bright light. This beautiful, white, clear energy is coming into your body with every in-breath and with every out-breath you are breathing out old tension that you have kept locked up in your body. See it as a color just leaving your body through your mouth and your nose. Just see it leaving through your mouth. And as you breathe in, breathe in through your nose and see the beautiful, white, fresh, clear energy entering your body. Now see your lungs filling with clear, white light with every in-breath you're taking. Now I want you to put your attention on your upper back and feel the tension being released from your upper back as it just melts away. And now move down to your lower back and your buttocks. Just feel the muscles just loosening up and releasing any blocked or trapped tension in the muscles. And work your way down your body, down through your legs, your thighs, your knees. Feel your knees and any tension in your knees. Feel it being released. your calves, your ankles, your feet, and your toes. I also want you to become aware of your arms, your elbows, your wrists, and your hands. Feel yourself releasing any trapped energy, any tension, any resentment, any hurt, anything that you've locked in for a long time, feel it. See it as a color and just see it melting away from your body right now. Now I want you to feel the lightness of who you really are. Say these words internally, not out loud, internally to yourself. 
I am feeling so light, so light, and I want you to feel yourself as though you are transparent and vision yourself as a translucent, bright light. Because your physical body now is so light and free of the density of the tension, it's so light that your true self, your inner self, your aura can shine right through and become aware of how huge that aura is. Become aware of how strong and bright and powerful. Visualize your own aura and become aware that it is so much bigger than your body and in fact it overlaps with the auras of the people sitting around you. All our auras are overlapping. Your aura is an expression of who you truly are. And it is my obligation and your obligation to always shine our auras as brightly as we can. Say to yourself that you will make a commitment to release everything that is not you. Everything that you keep trapped in your body that is not you. Say to yourself that I will make a commitment to release it every day so that I can be who I truly am. I will die to everything that is not me. I will die to the old me. I will release all that is not me so that I can be all that I can be and shine my light as brightly as I can. My light overlaps with everybody else's so I can feel what they are feeling. When we do this, it makes us more empathic to everyone around us. I want you to feel that power and feel the aura of everyone around you. And whenever you're ready, you can slowly bring yourself back into the room and wriggle your fingers and your toes and slowly open your eyes. This is the conclusion of the teachings of the Masters of the Far East. It has been clearly stated that life lived by the average individual is hypnotic. That is, the majority of men and women are not living life as it was intended at all. Not one in a million feels the freedom to live what he inwardly feels he should live. He has come under the world opinion of himself and this opinion is what he obeys, rather than the law of his own being. In this respect, and to this degree, he is living under a hypnotic spell. He lives under the delusion that he is a mere human being, living in a merely material world, and only hopes to escape it when he dies and goes to what he calls heaven. 
This is not the determination intended, intended in the plan and purpose of life. Obedience to one's inner nature. The expression of life as he instinctively feels it ought to be expressed is the very foundation of the life which the masters reveal as the only true mode of living. Obedience to your inner impersonal self, which places these desires all the time. You want to stop ignoring them. And one of the ways to do that, I wrote about in Wishes Fulfilled, and I'll share it with you now. <clears throat> Tonight, when you get into bed, as I do every night, I, um, I'm very careful about the last thoughts I think before I go off into marinate for the next eight hours in my subconscious mind. Because it is while we are in that subconscious mind of ours that we... <clears throat> we create what it is that we are going to experience when we awaken. This is from the book of Job. 33, verse 15 and 16. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instructions. It's right out of the holy book. So if you get into bed and your last five minutes before you're about to go into that state where you're going to have your instructions sealed, if you're reviewing all of the things that you don't like, all the things that are missing, all the things you're afraid of, all the stuff that uh, reminds you of how unfortunate you are, or how you don't have enough of this, or how they shouldn't have done that. And you use this, your subconscious mind cannot make a distinction between what you are telling it and what you're actually experiencing in your life. It just says, so this is what you want? And if you're talking and thinking about what's missing, what's wrong, what you don't like, who hurt you, <clears throat> as you drift off into sleep, and when you awaken after eight hours of having your instructions sealed based upon what you've placed in there while you're slumbering on your bed, you will wake up and this universe, this endless impersonal universe, that has no individuality in it, will offer you up experiences that match up to what you've placed into your subconscious mind. So one of the best and surest and quickest ways to begin the reprogramming process so that you can live by the light inside is to use these last five minutes to go over all the things in your life that <coughs> are the way you would like them to be, even if, <clears throat> even if you can't see it yet with your eyes, because, if I can find this, this is from the book of Romans, the New Testament, in the presence of him whom he believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. You must be able to call those things which do not yet exist in your physical sense, that is, you can't see them, touch them, feel them, get a hold of them with your five senses. You must be able to see it as if it already were there, especially in your interiority. So if there's a job that you would like, or if there's money that is missing, or if there's a relationship, or whatever it is that you might have thoughts about, you want, 
You want to be able to call those things which do not yet exist as though they did. See yourself in that state, in your imagination, and then go off to sleep as if it already were. And then you, when you awaken, if this is the way you see things, and some call this Pollyanna, you know, and that's just, just, just thinking positive when there's nothing negative there. But Pollyanna is one of my heroes. <laughs> I mean, she came into a town where everybody was grumpy and sad and miserable and depressed and angry. And she was just there for a couple of weeks and everybody is laughing and happy and looking at the positive side of life. It's like The Secret Garden, a book that impacted me probably more than any book when I was a young boy. It was being read to me by Mrs. Ingalls, my fourth grade teacher first year I lived with my mother so call those things which do not yet exist as those they did and I believe this takes place for those of you who are suffering from cancer or any debilitating illness that is in there see yourself as already healed see it program yourself and see if the universe and watch for the universe the impersonal universe to offer up experiences that match up to what you've placed in there. So Anita and I are going to have a little dialogue and then what role, uh, Anita, does, uh, does fear, what, what role does this thing play? I mean, you, you talked in your talk about how much fear there is, but this yes. relationship between fear and cancer, fear and cancer, I mean, you were so afraid of cancer. Yes. And you were around it and your friend had it and so on. Fear what? plays a huge role. It plays a huge role in cancer. It plays a huge role in a lot of areas in our life that is not working for us. I believe that whether it causes cancer or whether it causes you to act out in violence, fear is behind so much. For me, um, I lived my entire life in fear, fear of displeasing other people, um, fear of not getting things right, fear of not doing well. So every choice I made, every, every job I took, um, you know, I, I feared not pleasing the boss and so mm. on. And then, of course, when I started to become aware of cancer, people started to get cancer, I feared cancer. I was obsessive yeah. about it. It's, it's a way of thinking that you have to be really careful with, okay? And what I mean by this is, like, a simple little thing, like, why do you, um, why do you drive the speed limit? You know, there's a speed limit up there. It's out there for a reason. Uh, we know that. It's like why we stop at stop signs and red lights and so on. We have to kind of... But do you drive the speed limit because you know that this is a safe thing to do and you enjoy being safe and keeping other people around you in a, in a, in a safe way? Or are you afraid that if you, if you don't, you're going to get a ticket? Yeah. A simple little thing like that. Yeah. It's like, and we're constant, you know, these, these things go on with everything. What, what, I'm gonna, I would like to eat this, but if I can't eat that. I was with Sandra Ray one time, and she said, you know, it isn't what you eat that, that will, will make you sick. It's what you believe about what you eat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and also people always tell me that but, but fear has a purpose. We need to teach our kids to fear because fear keeps them safe. Mm -hmm. And I say, no, love keeps you safe, mm -hmm. not fear. When you love yourself, when you love people around you, you want to do what's right because you love your life or because you love the people, mm -hmm. not fear. Aren't you, are you afraid that your cancer is going to come back? No, I don't even think about it because I'm just too busy being happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so your father said to you, what, go and live fearlessly. Was it your father? My father said... Go and live your life fearlessly. And basically, that's all. I realized that that was all I had to do. I didn't have to figure out what my purpose is. I didn't have to figure out, you know, I saw myself speaking to people, but I didn't have to figure out how it was going to happen. I knew that as long as I loved myself um, and that I was true to myself, that I was authentic and just allowed myself to be who I am fearlessly, 
whatever was truly mine would unfold. Mm. When you were there, one other thing before we take the questions is, um, I talked in there about, uh, you know, this this third quote, the, the mind, the, you know, the uh, the light of the body is the eye. Um, seeing single. Is there any other way to see when you're in that realm other than just oneness? Is there, are there any opposites of any kind? Is there None. No, there's no opposites. There's no duality. It's totally a non-duality state or a singular state. And that's why there's no judgment. Because people always uh, still come up to me and say things like, how can you say there's no judgment? What about the people who have been rapists or murderers or whatever, mm -hmm. don't they get judged? No, they don't get judged because there is no duality. Everything just becomes known. We understand ourselves why we did it. And we ourselves feel, oh my gosh, I was in so much fear. How could I have done that? There's no nothing outside of you judging you, punishing you, because hell and heaven and punishment and judgment and laws and rules, that's all a here thing, not a there thing. We need, we need it here because people get confused, people get fearful, so we need to be protected. But no, there's no need for it in that realm. And what about all the people who have had cancer and, and, and died? They're blessed for crossing over. They crossed mm. over at the right time. We all have to go sometime. And I just also want people to know that if your loved one has gone, it doesn't mean they didn't come back because they didn't love you. If we get a choice, we will make the more unconditionally loving choice. So those who have crossed over, if they had a choice, it means they believed they could do more from that realm. Mm. Um, and I believe that the ones who get to cross over are very blessed and very oh, lucky. Yeah, that's been my experience in the kind of reading that I've been doing. And the, uh, just like I think about my mom so much and how much I loved her and all of that. And I think how blessed, how lucky she is. And, yeah. and this, this awareness, of, I don't know, maybe it's that, that's those three minutes from that telescope. But somehow this, in, this being able to experience the infinity of yeah. love. And, and that that's all there is that's and all there all. ever will be. Exactly. An infinity of just perfect. Yeah, that's all there is. Mm. It's just beautiful, blissful love. And people will cross over at the right time. We also need to stop feeling that those who die from cancer, we need to stop feeling that they failed in some way, that they failed to heal or that they lost their battle. They didn't lose their battle. It was now time for them to move on mm -hmm. to the next stage. Maybe they won. Emily Dickinson said. Thank you. <laughs> Emily Dickinson's famous four lines, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. <laughs> the carriage held but just ourselves and immortality.
What? They did not. 